Today, we are going to be talking about unit vectors. So this is something that I've always personally found kind of challenging. So I'm going to try my best to break this down in a simple way for you guys. But let's get right into it. So we're going to start off by defining what we call a coordinate system. So in physics, most problems that we'll be dealing with will be in two dimensions as of right now. We're going to move on into three dimensions later on, but for right now, let's just worry about two dimensions. So we're going to define a 2D coordinate system using the x and y axes as our directions or axes. So we can also formally put vectors onto a grid like so to more easily do vector operations. Think of them as just like an arrow starting arbitrarily from anywhere and moving on this coordinate system will allow us to easily do calculations with them. And here we also use a right-handed coordinate system. So it remains rigidly right-handed, it rotated rigidly and we'll only be working with these coordinate systems here. Once we have the coordinate system and our axes defined, in this case the x and y axes, the next thing we need are the actual unit vectors. So unit vectors are vectors with both a magnitude of exactly one and pointing in a particular direction. That's why we call it the unit vector because it only has the magnitude of one. It lacks a dimension in a unit, and the only purpose of a unit vector here is to point and specify a direction. For a normal xy coordinate system here, as I have shown here in blue and red, we have two unit vectors. We have like the i hat unit vector. This symbol here we call the hat symbol. And then in the y direction, we have the j hat unit vector. In Cartesian coordinates also, unit vectors are the same no matter what point we are in space. So like this one over here, this one is the same as this one, which is the same as this one, which is the same as this one. So they are all the same. Now vectors can be decomposed into their components. In unit vectors, which we just defined on the previous slide, allows us to break vectors apart into components. If you haven't watched the last video, we kind of went over this, so you can go rewatch that video if you want. We went into more detail about components. So unit vectors help us express other vectors. Here, for example, we have a vector A defined by the x and y components. And here, AX i hat and a y j hat are the vector components of a and i hat and j hat are just the unit vectors again that we use to define the direction a x and a y over here are the components scalar components of a and in order to find the magnitude of a we simply take the square root of the sum of the square of the scalar components. That was a little bit confusing to say, but just here in this equation, it kind of looks like the Pythagorean theorem because in fact, if you look on the graph on the right, we have a x over here, so that's the x. We have a y over here. And then the magnitude of a is just like the hypotenuse right here. So that indeed does give us the Pythagorean theorem. Now, after we split vectors into components, we can combine them axis by axis to add them. So let's consider the statement. A plus B gives us a new vector R, where both A and B are already vectors themselves. So this we can split into three different equations. So this singular equation gets split into these three. And this is because we split the vector R as well as both the vectors a and b into their vector components. We have the x, the y, and the z components. So for each one, for each component of the new vector, we simply add the respective components of the old vectors. For example, if we have rx here, we simply add ax and bx together. 
So this works the same for subtraction, but you're kind of adding negative components. So for example, if you have a minus b, you would just simply be doing this. It would be in the other direction. You're adding a negative component. Multiplying a vector is a little more complicated than addition, but there are two ways that we can go about multiplying. So first, if we have a vector multiplied by a scalar. So let's say we have a vector a multiplied by a scalar s, we will get a new vector. Now, the magnitude of the new vector, say we have s and a, the magnitude of the new vector is the product of the magnitude of vector a and the absolute value of um, scalar s. So it would simply just be s times a in this case because s is already positive. And the direction of the new vector would be the direction of vector a if s is positive, but the opposite direction of vector a if s is negative. So because s is positive here, let's just make that more explicit. This new vector here will be in the same direction as vector a. And division works the same way, but instead you're kind of multiplying by 1 over the scalar s. So if we had like this, you're simply just multiplying a by 1 over s. And both of the rules that we just discussed hold true. Now if we have a vector multiplied by a vector, here's where things get a little bit more complicated. We're going to go over two ways in the next couple of slides. One way produces a scalar, so that's why we call the scalar product. And then another way produces a vector, which we call the vector product. Now it's very important that you recognize how to do these different multiplication when it comes to vectors and you don't get these confused. Because multiplying a vector by a scalar is not the same as multiplying a vector by a vector. So let's start off with the scalar product, because I personally think this is a little bit easier than the vector product. So we call the scalar product the dot product as well. You'll see here that we have like a little dot here in the middle. That is the dot of the dot product. So we define the dot product of two vectors as the magnitude of the two vectors multiplied by the cos theta where theta is the angle between the directions of the two vectors. So there are two possible angles here. We have one possible angle is theta, and the other possible angle is just 360 degrees minus theta, or 2 pi minus theta if you're working in radians. That's because the cos of both values will give you the same exact value. So it doesn't matter which theta you use, as long as it gives you the same cos theta value. And here, the um, commutative laws apply, so all three of these equations will give you the same value. Now you'll see later that in the vector product, that isn't necessarily true. So here we can see that the product of the two quantities will give the magnitude, will use the magnitude of one vector, and will have the scalar component of the second vector along the direction of the first vector. So here we have, in the lower right corner, we have a vector b and b cosine theta, a b cosine theta. So the scalar component of the second vector along the direction of the first, or the first is vector a, would look something like this. So it has the magnitude of one vector, but it has the direction along the first vector. So this would be b cos phi, as we have here, and in the bottom here, we just have a expansion in using the components of the two vectors. So here we can see that it's a little bit easier, I say, than the vector product, because in a scalar product, you simply multiply the corresponding components together and add them together. Here we can see that we multiply ax by bx, ay by by, and az by bz, to, and then add them together to get our final um, dot product. And that is because the dot product describes the um, components that are parallel to each other.
So if they are not in the same direction, in other words, if they don't share the same component here, then they're simply not going to contribute to the dot product, especially if they're perpendicular to each other. It would be zero, the dot product would be zero. Now we'll move on to what I think is the more complicated one, which is the vector product, also known as the cross product. You can remember because we use a cross symbol here. So the cross product is where we take the magnitudes of the two vectors again, but this time we're multiplying by sine of theta instead of cos of theta. And now that also means the angle matters now. So we're gonna be using the smaller angle between the two vectors. And the vector product is perpendicular to the plane that contains both A and B. So um, let's say if A was in this direction, we'll call that the Z direction. And if B was in the X direction, then the scalar product would be in the Y direction because that is perpendicular to the plane which contains both A and B. And here we see the decomposition of the entire cross product. So we would multiply the component of A and cross that with all the components of B. And in the end, this is the long equation at the bottom that we get. Now I find that an easy way to remember this is if we draw or if we write the um, components in the unit vector letters of all of them to get the i component in the final cross product, you're going to do the first vector in, in the y direction multiplied by the second vector in the z direction minus the first vector in the z direction times the second vector in the y direction. So you're kind of going like this. So i, you take j and k, and j, you take k and i, and for k, you take i and j, as you can see in the bottom here. Okay, so that was it for unit vectors and the lecture on unit vectors, along with some important operations like um, multiplication of vectors and multiplication of vectors by scalars that you'll need to know for upcoming topics. It's important that you um, learn how to utilize these vectors because they are extremely important, especially in later lessons where we work with multiple dimensions instead of just like two-dimensional motion or motion along a straight line. So make sure you grasp these knowledge concept points, and I hope to see you in the next video.